this lecture, we'll define what variables are. Variables are our way of translating abstract concepts, something like democracy, into something that we can study in the real world, something that we can actually measure and compare over time. Uh, so this lecture is going to define dependent and independent variables, and we'll explain what operationalization is, and operationalization being the specification of how you will actually measure your variable. So first, what are variables? What do we mean when we say that term? Variables are real-world measurements of abstract concepts. So you guys have just finished read, uh, watching that lecture on what concepts are and what conceptualizations are. We know that this is something like democracy that doesn't actually exist in the real world. Um, is something that is in our minds, and then you have to translate that into something concrete in order to study it. So if you want to take democracy, you need to, with a variable, specify which countries would be, would be democratic, which countries would not be democratic. You set up um, what would be the things that would vary in order to assess whether a country is democratic. So key features, variables must be able to vary. You must be able to say that a country is democratic or less democratic or not democratic. There's not just one fixed outcome. And variables are used to assess causal relationships. When we say that something caused something else, um, those somethings are variables that we're talking about. So to get really at the intuition behind what variables are, I want to talk through an example because I know this can be sort of abstract and difficult to understand if you're not used to the variable framework. So I'm going to talk through an example um, from a book that I love by Eric Potashnik which is called Reforms at Risk. And this book examines the fate of public interest reforms in the United States. Um, so Potashnik is looking at the question of why some reforms that are in the public interest that make um, overall a country better off, not just benefiting one narrow group, but overall the country, why some of these are sticky, last a long time, and other ones are initially passed, but then fall apart. So the two cases that I'm going to talk about that he looks at. Um, the first one is the 1986 tax reform. You see there Ronald Reagan signed the bill into law, and the tax reform was a bipartisan effort that was hailed as a way to close tax loopholes. So this is something that was supported by both Democrats and Republicans. Democrats supported because it was a way to protect money for social spending, and Republicans supported because closing these loopholes would reduce interference with market signals. Um, so this was something that was initially passed, and as we'll see, um, ends up being undermined over time. Another example is from the 1978 federal deregulation of the airline industry. So there's Jimmy Carter signing that one into law. And before 1978, the airline industry was heavily regulated. It was very expensive to get a ticket. There were not as many uh, routes as there are today. Uh, so this deregulation was aimed to get government out of making all these judgment calls and overregulating the airline industry so that you would really have a boon to consumers who would be able to fly more often, more frequently, and with lower fares. This is something that was uh, much more efficient and was in the public interest. So using this example, we're going to talk through what both dependent and independent variables are. First, the definition the dependent variable. Um, the dependent variable is the phenomenon thought to be caused by some other phenomenon, the independent variable. We also refer to the dependent variable as dv, dependent variable, or we just call it y. Um, so this is the outcome of our study. This is uh, the factor that we want to be investigating the causes of. So thinking about this for the Potashnik example, the dependent variable is the durability of the reform. So asking, does this reform persist over several years? Is it undermined with amendments that really cut back the power of the reform? So thinking through these examples, the tax reform initially was successful in passing, but then more loopholes are gradually added back in. You have amendments as it goes through um, the budget process year by year, you have more and more added back. So in the end, the tax reform that we knew it from 1986 no longer really exists because it's been so undermined over time. Yet, with the airline deregulation, um, you do see durability of the reform. 
it was originally deregulated, and then it stayed deregulated over time. So you have a lot more increase in flights that go throughout the world um, and throughout the United States. And you also see that prices fall, as we can see with this graph here, um, that the, the fares of, of air travel have fallen quite dramatically over time. So routes have increased and fares have dropped, and overall you don't see an increase in regulation um, from, from the federal government in the airline industry. So to sum up, the dependent variable here, this outcome, is the durability of reform. In the tax reform example, not durable at all, uh, completely undermined after a couple of years. In the example of the airline regulation, it was durable. You don't see a reemergence of, of regulation. So thinking about independent variables here. The independent variable is the cause that we're looking at. It's the phenomenon that we think is going to cause the other phenomenon, the dependent variable. So we can call this IV, independent variable, or just X often. Um, so for this example from Batashnik, the independent variable would be the elimination of vested interests. So to explain why some reforms are durable and other ones are not, one of Patashman's arguments is that if a reform is able to knock out, completely eliminate groups that may oppose it in the future, then it's going to have a much greater chance of being durable. So let's think about the tax reform example. Um, you do pass this reform, and it's initially successful getting through Congress, but what happens? You have those same business groups that have um, lobbying organizations on K Street in Washington. They are defeated with this battle, but they don't go away. They lick their wounds, and then they come back again and try to get um, their interests represented. Once again, so you get more and more loopholes to add it back in. Uh, compare that with the example of the airline deregulation. So part of the deregulation was to eliminate the government agency that really had advocated for regulation. And so that's gone. You know, that's a big proponent of the, the old status quo, and they're no longer around. So the Civil Aeronautics Board doesn't exist. Now it's been replaced by the FAA. And you have certain airlines that had benefited from the old system, which was really inefficient, but they were large um, carriers that were able to really um, dominate that system. Well, when they're exposed to competition, they start to go under. So Pan Am was one of the last ones to go under, and it folded um, in the early 1990s. But you see the decline of these old interests that had benefited from the status quo. Instead, you see groups like Southwest Airlines that really are able to offer low fares and take advantage of these new opening and competition. So the cause here, elimination of vested interests, uh, and that enables the durability of reform, which is our dependent variable. Operationalization is the process of measuring our variables. So we've just laid out the logic behind what variables are, and now we need to think about how do we actually uh, get to our variables. So operationalization is the process of measuring these variables. Um, and in particular, you need to think about how you would measure each dimension of your underlying concept. So before we talked about how when you're conceptualizing, you might have several dimensions um, behind uh, your variable. Um, so you need to figure out how to capture each element of those. Um, and you need to think about how your variable will vary. vary. So thinking about the reform durability example, you need to define what you mean by reform durability. Um, this is going to take different forms when you're talking about tax reform versus deregulation. So you need to specify what it is that you're looking for. How would you say that tax reform and, and airline deregulation are the same thing? Um, so Potashnik specifies that durability has to last several years. It has to be at least five years. Um, and he also specifies that it's not simply repealing the law. That could be um, a way you would undermine durability. So that would be one way, right? Um, but you could also just layer on additional um, changes and reforms that completely undermine the essence. So key is defining what that essence of the reform was and looking at what are ways that you might um, undermine it. So if you're talking about the tax reform, uh, they didn't repeal the tax reform. However, you, they layered on additional amendments and added those 
um, tax breaks back in. So one final thing that I want to point out is that operationalization is not the same thing as defining the specific sources of your data. Um, it's a definition of what you're going to be looking for, right? It's part of a definition. So just remember that conceptualization is defining the concept. Um, operationalization is defining the measures for your variable. Um, but they're both definitions and aren't getting to the nitty gritty of data collection just yet.